know if yeah, this is the table stand? The, the stand for the microphone? Oh, yes, so because it was kind of heavy, and yeah. we needed to be only two, and the three speakers, and I just put it here. Oh, you're the yeah. best. Okay, great. Yeah, I didn't want to I'll just, oh, I okay. stole them out of uh, Azion. Oh, okay, got it. Great. No, I won't even disturb you. You do it. I'm going to attend. I'm going to backbench, though. Um, I, ha I have some email I got to crush, so. Yeah. Is, is that okay? Yeah, 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 of course. And I'm really sorry I missed out on the Chile faculty. Oh, okay. No, I feel like it's I, okay. I made a big mistake. Yeah. No, we, I'm going to take a picture of this. We went with um, a captain in the Navy, in the Navy and a captain in the military. Oh, was, God. I wish I, I Next time. See, this is the cost of having 60,000 unread emails. Uh, no, it was really interesting. Like, I don't, I didn't know a ton about Antarctica issues. Oh, it's huge. And Actually, 60,973. Oh, no, Nothing too bad. I've only gotten three so far. Yeah. <laughs> Saturday's like, not so bad. Yeah. I'm the type of person has too many mailboxes. Yeah, I wish I was. Yeah, I can't have unopened. I, I used to do that, and then I had three kids. <laughs> so, How old are your kids? I, uh, they're nine or um, but ten, almost nine, and five. The little Vikings, I call them. Yeah, and they are. They uh, storm. Yeah, they're all known at the Fletcher School. They attend events here sometimes if I uh, if I need them to. Yeah. Little Julie in particular. Yeah. Oh my God! So she she literally I had her in here, and she ran into the dean's office. I was trying to give some of the dean. Like, the dean's on a webinar. Oh. You can't make it up. I was like, jeez. But uh, she loved it. Yeah, it was fine. Oh. Yeah, but yeah, she's uh, yeah, she but she uh, yeah, she loves it here, and she knows that Alice, who she yeah. calls Miss Alice, who's the admin for our security studies program, right. USL mm -hmm. gives her more candy. But she gets a Halloween. I mean, she literally will be like, That's "Oh, so Juliet's funny. here." She'll get a bag she knows how to this big, and she knows give them like. Yeah. I was like, "Jesus, Alice, quit killing me!" <laughs> like this kid's gonna be bounced off the walls for hours. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then she likes Miss Lupita, who's my admin. 
who spins her on her chair. Aww. So she'll be like, I want to go see Miss Alice. I'm like, okay, let's go. And then I want to go see Miss Loopy then. Yeah. But yeah, she does. She likes it here. She's like, Dad, can we come to work? I want chocolate. I'm like, all right. It's a big well. playground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's fun though. They're they're pretty cool here. They, okay. it, it makes it fun. Okay. Yeah. So hard. it's hard. Um, the it's amazing to me. Okay. I mean, kindergarten this year. Center sports. Uh, they uh, for public school. They started kindergarten like one week after. It's like, how is this? Who was the person who said this is a good idea? Mm -hmm. I'm like, one week after. After all the others went. So my fifth oh. grader started. And for a whole week, like Julia has nothing, and there's no, there's no like daycare because why would they do it, right? So there's no, there was like no option. So I was like, and, it, and Tufts had started, so it was the first two weeks of Tufts, the orientation week, and the first week of class. I had a fifth grader as my own sport. Yeah, to hear it. Through orientation and everything else. It's you, can, you can only do graduate or also undergraduate. Oh no, you're you're welcome to take. Uh, yeah, I, I have to sign a permission slip, but I, anyone who comes, yeah, yeah, it's for credit. Oh, for credit. Yeah, really. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're most welcome. Yeah, either of my classes, and I only teach in the spring. But yeah, yeah, uh, just come to uh, come and I'll, I'll sign. So that's what I wrote. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then I have to. Go. Well, last night you... I took down my touchdowns. My IT played oh, last night. Touchdown. What's uh, what's the score? I oh, know we were down by two touchdowns last time I checked. Like, 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 Last time we beat Notre Dame. <laughs> oh, that was yeah, such a waste. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was like in the teens, right? Yeah, it was we like had, we were like we had that streak against us. Yeah, we were we were like pretty good for like a minute. We were ranked, right? Yeah, we were yeah. ranked. For, we were ranked for a little second. We were Malcolm Perry. Don't. Were we ranked with Malcolm Perry? Yeah. I think we were for a little bit. Twenty something. <laughs> yeah, we scored. That's really not bad. It's going to be insane. Hold up. You know what? I'm going to I think I'd like... <laughs> <laughs> that would be one, though. We'd probably... I wonder if they give us a day off of school. Because, like, they've gotten that in the past for, like, really, really... Big. That would be nuts. We can't storm the field, though, because it's, like, a football stadium. Dude, they, they always say... They, there's never going to be a situation where they say it is acceptable to storm the field. <laughs> True, but, like, it's, it would be... Like, it's easier to storm the field than maybe than, like, a... Um, a can you get me there? MNT. MNT. I imagine it's actually still a point. Yeah, but you can storm it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your water bottle? Yeah. 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 We can take a break on this stairs. I mean, you think Tennessee? Dennis, we're allowed to storm when they beat Bama. Do you think they're allowed to upgrade? Speaking of Tennessee, they're allowed to upgrade. Yeah. 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 I know I said it was the best class of sophomores. It was the most fun because they got to go on field trips and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you want to go to the house. With their laboratory assignments, they literally went out and flew planes and got data. Yeah. If Tennessee could lose, it'd be great. As much as I love Tennessee and like what they've done, they're providing Michigan. Yeah, it's getting their job. Yeah, yeah. Are you from Michigan? I lived in Detroit for like 10 years. Oh, really? Oh, um, so it's like that? Proved everything and gave extra credit. Huh? Well, my family, I was actually born so, right in Ohio. I was, born right in, I was born in Columbus, or you know Riverside Hospital? Mm. I was born there. I moved to Michigan when I was like two, and then maybe like yeah. one, and then I moved back into like fifth or sixth grade. To what, Ohio? Yeah. Aren't three of y'all from Ohio? Yeah. yeah. I'm a big Ohio fan, but I'm also a big Michigan fan. In terms of like the states, but for like teams, all my teams are Michigan teams. Because like I was like, I don't know, 10 when like I was choosing my, fo like, my football team yeah, and like, like, my other teams, and like, <laughs> I was Michigan, yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. And honestly, like making bets every year and losing bets every year, like I, my the Michigan Wolverines didn't beat the Buckeyes from like fourth grade for me until I was a sophomore in college. And so losing bets on it every year really like emboldened in my heart the desire to be Michigan yeah. fan. Dogs. Yeah. This year should be pretty good though. This year, this year we're gonna rock your socks off in the show. <laughs> Man, I really hope Tennessee loses. That'd be so beautiful. I mean, it's ranked, right? 
Yeah, Tulane. Tulane versus UCF is uh, college game day. Wow. When? Uh, both ranks. UCF is ranked like uh, 24. You also is ranked like 19. It's kind of sick. Five champions. It's TCU. And Liberty is freaking throwing the towel in against UConn because. Liberty beat freaking Arkansas last week. Oh, well, you know what? You're on the Wi-Fi. I'm on the Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, Liberty beat Arkansas good. last year, like last week, and then UConn, like five and five, like pretty terrible, like northeastern team is beating them. I love college football. It makes it fun. It does. Make it's it like, fun. I love just the, I love the back and forth and variance. Oh fuck! Notre Dame scored again. Uh-huh. What's the score? Twenty-eight thirteen. Oh, that's as bad as I would have thought. Yeah, no, it was only it was only twenty-one thirteen. Like a minute Do you think ago. better or worse after the half? Do it does Navy? Yeah, worse. Be- better. Really? You think better? Yeah, well, compared to the first quarter, we yeah, already yeah, before, yeah, but that's terrible. Very true. We let them score on the first drive. We want adversity. It's like beating the underdog. This is honestly a horrible. Um, out of a week for college football. It's not terrible. Not much is going on. LSU versus Arkansas is interesting. I like big TCU like, versus Texas and UCF versus Tulane is all I'm looking at. Well, I mean, like you have to look at the ones that aren't ranked, like both of them are ranked like white. I don't know if you saw the highlights of that. <laughs> uh, Purdue versus Illinois pretty much decides the Big Ten West. LSU Arkansas. I do not care about the Big Ten West though. <laughs> well, LSU Arkansas determines the SEC East, so. I'm actually not even worried about I that game. I know LSU is going to beat Arkansas. Like, Arkansas has been choking this year. They they were ranked number ten starting off the season. Well, true, but and they're, now they're, they're ranked. Okay, so they true, can. but like they Arkansas, is down, Arkansas is down by three. They barely beat Missouri State. Think about that. All right. Although I predict. Oh, well, Vanderbilt's beating Kentucky. Uh, I don't. Kentucky is the most overrated freaking team. I hate how much of any SEC team. I, I haven't seen him. That would SEC be bias is absolutely. Yeah. 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 You guys got, you guys have the first game. Yeah, I mean, you didn't like that. Don't worry, just take it. Drop off. The game over there. USC and Orange. I mean, they've been in the game. Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Jumbo cast watch party. Those are cowards. Hey, yeah. Basically, single-handedly. Mmm. Let's go. Let's go. I'm going to Boston. I'm going, I'm going to Boston. Yeah, he's he's a dude, folks. I'm seeing the old fam. I'm just going up to Fort Smith. I'm high. I'm high. I'm going to ride tomorrow. Whenever I like call my mom, the very first thing. I'm going to ride tomorrow. 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 I mean, this yeah. is like a. Well, how he sleeps. Yeah, I slept on the car ride. So I ran to my first year I checked. I was driving in shotgun. I was in the back of the car. I'm surprised you didn't say anything. I was like, it's like about 20 years. I can't believe I can't believe we got Moss on national television. We still uh, we have just posted yeah, catch yeah, of the year. Uh, and it said Notre Dame. You know how many Met commanders they go to drive? Which are pretty good. Out of your uh, uh, Atlantic? Uh, 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 in terms of back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. I don't know if it would be my. I actually think. No, wait. Maybe she has a prospect. Yes. Oh, it's like here. Oh, it's a long weekend. And they're not playing defenses in a show. That is actually a crisis. I actually. Yeah, I, I already saw it. I'm back. 
And you know it's pretty sensitive to like pick where you're sitting right now. It's strange. Yeah, there's like it's like two hundred and one. No, it's two hundred and one. It's like you better like fundamentally like nine hundred. If you go, you're going to get fat. You're going to get fat. Imagine what are you guys doing? Oh, no, it wasn't him. Yeah, first. So, like, what if you were a second class with, like, a car, like, you were going to have your body? Yeah, I mean, some people park them in, like, different garages, but they're not. Oh, I know that guy. Yeah, people don't have them. Test. Testing. Hello? Oh, hi. Great. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final panel of CMRC 2022. Uh, I'm Nick Martin, and I'm the treasurer for Allies. Uh, I'm a junior. Uh, this panel will discuss how terror and violence have been used against people to expand state power in Russia's Ukra invasion of Ukraine. And we'll also talk about how Russia is leveraging its energy and other resources in the conflict. Um, so we have two panelists today. Uh, Further away from me, we have Mr. Eric Burakovsky, and closer to me, we have Dr. Robert Person. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Benjamin Schmidt could not make it today. Um, each speaker will give uh, some quick introductory remarks, uh, but before that, I'll kind of introduce them and give them a quick introduction. After that, we'll move on to an audience Q&A after I pose a couple quick questions, so like the panels we've done before. Uh, so, Mr. Burakovsky is the Assistant Director of the Russia and Eurasia Program at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. His research interests include the role of media in international politics, public and elite opinion, soft power, public diplomacy, and U.S.-Russia relations. His work has been published by The Conversation, Time, The National Interest, and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and elsewhere. So, Mr. Burkowski, thank you for joining us today. If you want to offer some remarks. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. I have been involved with the Institute for Global Leadership for many years, starting in 2014 when I began at the Fletcher School as a master's student. I was a teaching assistant for the epic uh, colloquium and symposium. That year, the topic was Russia. So in some sense, I've come full circle sitting in front of you today and discussing the Russia-Ukraine war. And I'm always happy to be a part of uh, student activities. Uh, my research, uh, as Nick said, is focused on uh, Russian public and elite opinion. I look at Russian domestic politics, and so many of the things that I will discuss uh, today will be from Russia's perspective. I'm much less of a Ukraine expert than I am a Russia uh, expert. And so uh, let me give you just a few minutes of opening remarks. Uh, that way we can have plenty of time for conversation and questions. This war began with Russia's intention to bring about regime change in Ukraine within a matter of a few days. And that didn't happen. Ukraine uh, was able to resist. Uh, one of the pivotal moments in the war was when Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky came out with his phone uh, on the streets and recorded himself and his closest advisors saying, we're still here in Kiev and we're going to stay. And that, I think, uh, was what spurred Ukrainian resolve to keep fighting. And so, of course, Russia's initial offensive on Kiev uh, failed. Russia had to regroup. 
And then the war transformed into essentially a war of attrition. The next few months, Russia spent taking over uh, additional territories in southern and eastern Ukraine. Uh, and uh, it looked like there was more or less a standstill with Russia taking over parts of the Kharkiv region, of course, Donetsk and Luhansk, which Russia controlled uh, previously, before February 24th of this year, Zaporizhia, Kherson. And then uh, what we saw in September is Ukraine taking over, regaining control of the Kharkiv region. This was the first major successful Ukrainian counteroffensive. And it showed that R Russia has tremendous problems in terms of the training of its troops in terms of equipment, in terms of logistics, and in terms of morale. And Ukraine has been able to continue counteroffensives up until now. Just yesterday, Ukraine took back control of Kherson, the city. This was the only major capital that Russia took control of uh, in the last eight months. So now uh, we are at a point in the war that I think is pivotal because uh, Russia has retreated past the Dnieper River. And uh, there's a question about the extent to which Ukraine will be able to continue its counteroffensives. Now, I'm by no means a military expert, and I am by no means an energy expert, so I will save uh, re remarks about um, that to, <laughs> to my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Pearson. However, let me explain the Russian point of view. How does Russia see this war today? So Russia tells itself basically three stories about how it can still win the war. The first is that the West is largely weak and divided, and that at some point, Western military aid, Western intelligence support, financial and humanitarian assistance will start to fall. Russian policymakers believe that as economic problems in the West become more severe, we're seeing interest rates rising, we're seeing what many people are calling a recession, uh, the energy crisis in Europe, uh, and uh, who knows uh, what the gas prices will look like in the coming months, depending on how cold the winter gets, we may start seeing divisions uh, in the West in terms of support for Ukraine. And Moscow believes that it can outweigh the West, right? That essentially time is on the Kremlin's side. And because this is a war of attrition, they have been targeting Ukrainian energy infrastructure, civilian infrastructure, in order to, um, uh, well, essentially with, with two major goals. Uh, one is, is more political, to uh, terrorize the population and to create a humanitarian crisis where, where there's another flood of Ukrainian refugees and more uh, Ukrainians internally displaced. And two is to uh, debilitate Ukraine's uh, military production, uh, particularly its uh, steel production, uh, to uh, hamper its uh, railways, right? Because Ukrainian railways use electricity. And uh, if, if they don't have access to, to power, they'll need to, be power, uh, to use diesel, which is far more expensive. Uh, and, of course, uh, the financial position of the Ukrainian government, which, which is getting billions of dollars just to, uh, to be sustained. Um, and Russia believes that it can uh, continue to sustain its economy despite Western sanctions, right? That uh, the te technological sanctions will not be too painful, and we can go into the specifics, but essentially because uh, of continued uh, parallel imports uh, of certain technologies and also military support from countries like Iran, North Korea. Um, the second major story that Russia tells itself is that China will be Russia's lifeline. 
that uh, China is a technological powerhouse and that China is, is rising. Um, China has been buying more and more Russian oil in the past eight months. And uh, China is helping Russia in terms of de-dollarization, right? Russia's uh, central bank uh, currency reserves were frozen at the beginning of the war. And so Russia increasingly needs to find ways to conduct financial transactions in something other than the US dollar. Um, and finally, uh, and this is a, uh, a very important point, Russia believes that it can negotiate directly with the United States, not with Ukraine. I recently had a conversation with uh, Russian scholars, and I asked them, uh, what do you think about Ukrainian domestic politics? Do you think they will play into negotiations surrounding the war? To which my Russian peers responded that they don't pay much attention to internal politics in Ukraine, because they believe that if there is an agreement made between Russia and the United States, that the US will ultimately pressure Ukraine to go along with that deal. The reason Russia believes this is because Ukraine relies almost entirely on American military and intelligence support, as well as financial and humanitarian assistance. So the United States has a degree of leverage over Ukraine. That being said, the United States still believes that Ukraine has agency. And when you talk to uh, government officials in the Biden administration, uh, they say that uh, we can't achieve, uh, they say nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, right? That has been the slogan. Uh, and there have been some initial divisions uh, in the US government uh, on this point. Uh, uh, Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, this was an article published in the, the New York Times just yesterday, uh, said that now the time is ripe for negotiations. But Biden, I think, has been more reluctant uh, on this point. And uh, of course, uh, there's a consensus in the US government that Ukraine should ultimately decide when and how to negotiate. So I will stop there. And I will turn it back to Nick. Thank you so much for the overview. Um, so Dr. Person is an associate professor of international relations at the United States Military Academy at West Point uh, and director of their curriculum in international affairs. He teaches courses on Russian and post-Soviet politics, international political economy, democratic and authoritarian regimes, and international relations. Dr. Person regularly consults as a Russia subject matter expert for the Army, Department of Defense and other US government agencies. He's a faculty affiliate at West Point's Modern War Institute and a term member of the Council of Foreign Relations. So thank you for joining us today, if you want to give some remarks. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks for the introduction, Nick. Uh, thank you, um, Arik, for, for those remarks. Um, it, it, it's actually perfect, uh, perfectly aligned, because I'm going to pick up uh, where you left off. Um, and. Uh, thank you uh, to, to all of you uh, for uh, participating in, in, in this event. Thank you for the invitation. It really is a pleasure and an honor to, to be here with you. Um, so uh, so I, I'll pick it up with uh, General Milley's uh, statement that now the time might be right for negotiations. Um, I should probably uh, note, since I think this is being streamed uh, and recorded, these are my personal views uh, and, and not the official policy or position of the United States government. Um, and, you know, I will respectfully disagree uh, with uh, General Milley's assessment, um, not necessarily sort of from, from normative grounds, although I, I do, um, you know, admit to, to having uh, some strong uh, beliefs about, um, you know, the justness of, of Ukraine's fight and and um, uh, and the injustice of of Russians Russia's actions in in bringing it it about. Um, but let's talk about uh, this possibility of settlement, this possibility of negotiations and windows and opportunities and and whatnot. 
Um, and I'd actually like to do it if, if you will humor me um, with a little bit of political science theory. Um, I, I have three cadets uh, who are, are currently suffering under uh, our Intro to IR course, um, where they learn this stuff, but hopefully they and all of you um, you know, can take away the position that uh, sometimes theory can be useful in, in sort of structuring in a systematic way how we process and analyze and understand current events. Um, and so here I would take you to what uh, political science refers to as bargaining models of war. Um, and it's sort of taking insights from uh, the process. Yeah, you guys just had this lesson uh, a few weeks ago. Um, taking uh, insights from bargaining interactions uh, and applying it to warfare, applying it to how wars begin and how wars end. And sort of the fundamental insight that, that we start with is, is a very simple one, which is war is costly. War is incredibly costly. Again, here I will uh, take General Milley's word. Um, I think his, his estimate in that same interview uh, was that approximately 100,000 uh, soldiers um, have died on each side. 100,000 Russians, 100,000 Ukrainians, um, not to mention civilian loss, uh, casualties, um, and, and of course just the, the economic costs of, uh, of that much destruction. So war is costly, and two sides would be better off if they could figure out ahead of time and come to the same division of goods, whatever it is we're fi uh, fighting over, if you could come to that same division and distribution without paying the cost of fighting, then everyone would be better off. Um, now, of course, it's, it's obvious that this is just sort of a theoretical construct because you can't actually know how the war will end. Um, and, and even if you said, well, okay, well, how about everybody puts their cards on the table? You know, let's, let's, I'll show you all my capabilities and, and you sh show me yours and we'll figure out, you know, what would we get if we actually fought this war? Uh, let's save the trouble, let's save the cost and, and get right to it. Um, that obviously doesn't happen. There are good incentives to, to keep your capabilities uh, private uh, because you want to achieve the best settlement possible. Um, but there are some other really important theoretical reasons in these models that explain uh, why states um, generally will not um, sort of come to a bargain settlement of the issue prior to the outbreak of combat. Um, and it also gives us some really important clues to uh, to the role that combat plays in these bargaining models and ultimately how this shapes possible outcomes. So there's sort of three big roadblocks that sort of prevent, uh, that often can prevent negotiated settlements to, uh, to wars. Uh, one, the thing that the sides may be fighting over may be indivisible. Um, and issues or um, or, or principles that, that are sort of deeply rooted in, in identity um, and other sort of existential interests, uh, those, are, those, are hard to, uh, those are hard to divide. Um, those are hard to sort of bargain 60-40. Ironically, um, we actually can imagine territory as one of the more easily divided things that you could bargain over. We, we can negotiate, you know, okay, how, what percentage of the Donbass um, you know, do you get to keep, and what percentage do we get to keep? Um, the challenge in in the case of this war with that sort of sort of divisible settlement is that uh, number one, as Ark noted, you know, this war did not start, and and frankly has never truly been about territory as the objective of fighting. Um, initially, Russia's, uh, you know. It, Intentions were to go in, uh, execute uh, forcible regime change in Kyiv, and, and pull out and be left with a pliant pupper, puppet government um, in, in Ukraine that, that would do uh, Russia's bidding. And fundamentally, I think what Russia sought and continues to seek uh, is a Ukrainian government that um, essentially aligns itself uh, towards Russia um, and away from, from the West. Uh, and uh, and one that 
uh, willingly gives Moscow veto authority over its foreign and defense policies. And that's what uh, Moscow thought they could achieve uh, by replacing the government. Obviously, they failed spectacularly. And so now it's sort of been this fallback battle over territory. But, but again, I don't think that conquering additional Ukrainian lands were ever the end in, uh, in, a, in and of themselves. Um, on the Ukrainian side, you know, this conflict has, has become, it always has been uh, existential. It, it has been cast as sort of the, the future survival of the Ukrainian nation. Um, and in that respect, you know, Russia's well-documented genocidal activities uh, in the areas that it has occupied um, has further reinforced that. Uh, and so the possibility of, of even imagining that there is anything that Ukraine could bargain away in this sort of existential uh, fight for its identity existence, its territorial existence, again, that, that's a pretty big hurdle to, um, to, to bargaining and, and coming to a negotiated settlement. Um, the other critical barrier to ending wars in a negotiated fashion uh, is, of course, the inability of one or both sides to credibly commit to adhere to the terms of the settlement in the long run. Um, it's, it's your classic uh, credible commitment problem. And again, anybody that has been following Russian politics and foreign policy for more than about five minutes uh, understands that they have a credibility problem when it comes to adhering to any sort of agreement, treaty, truce, or terms of settlement. And so I think that original goal of, of political control of Ukraine foreign, Ukrainian foreign defense policy, that is and always will be. Um, and so Russia will always have uh, a strong incentive to undermine, revisit, uh, or otherwise chip away at any kind of settlement, even if they were to sign one uh, in, in the foreseeable future. Um, and then the final sort of hurdle uh, comes down to uh, fundamentally a disagreement over the likely outcome of fighting. Uh, again, if it were patently obvious which side would win and which side would lose, uh, before we started fighting, the weaker side would say, yep, you know what, you got it. Uh, you guys are going to win this one, so let's go ahead and get to that negotiated division right away. Um, but that doesn't happen because both sides of this war, even from the first day that Russian troops crossed the frontiers, both sides believed that they had a fighting chance of winning the conflict. Um, and so they fundamentally disagree. Why do they disagree? Because each state has incomplete information about the capabilities and the resolve of their adversary. And until you start fighting, you don't know um, sort of who actually has the superior fighting force. Now, as it turns out, especially in the case of the Russians, you may not have very good information about the capabilities and resolve of your own forces. And that's been one of the, frankly, pleasant surprises of this conflict. Uh, is, is just how poorly the Russian army has fought. Um, and that has been, uh, that has been a surprise uh, to many, uh, Russia experts included. Um, no less pleasant, um, but perhaps less surprising to many of my colleagues in the US military who have been working closely with Ukrainian defense forces uh, in training missions since 2014, is how well they have fought. Um, and so both when it comes to their resolve, again, defending their nation's existence, uh, but also their, their skill in, in, um, in, in combat uh, and military operations. Uh, again, it took many by surprise, uh, certainly took the Russians by surprise. And so what we see now is a situation where uh, Ukraine clearly has the upper hand as long as they remain well equipped to continue the fight. Um, Russia does not yet believe themselves beaten. Um, and though they have suffered significant losses, um, they also can continue, uh, they, they still do have various deep reserves to continue sort of burning through. So they can continue to fight for a lot longer. Um, Ukraine similarly uh, does not see themselves beat. Um, and they continue to uh, you know, seek the restoration of full territory, territorial sovereignty 
over their lands. So that's a really long way of saying that neither Kiev or Moscow is actually ready to negotiate. Uh, they don't think themselves beat. Neither side has achieved their fundamental war aims. And so this idea that just because it's getting cold, which you couldn't tell by you know, the, the June weather outside, this idea that, that just because winter is here, just because we've been doing this for eight or nine months and gosh, we're getting tired, means that, that the opportunity is ripe for settlement. Um, I, I, I just, it, it doesn't stand up. Uh, I think, uh, to expectations. And so, for better or for worse, the expectation is that the fighting will continue. It will probably continue for a very, very long time. It will continue until Ukraine either fully ejects uh, Russian forces from their lands or something uh, catastrophic happens to the government in Kyiv. Uh, and, uh, you know, we try not to speculate on, on things like that. Um, but, uh, but I think we're in it for, for the long haul as long as Ukraine is able to keep fighting. So I, uh, I will cut it there and, and hand, it back to, uh, hand it back to Nick. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, I guess I'll start with one of my own prepared questions, but while I do that, I'll invite all of you guys to start thinking of your own questions for after we're done. Um, so I'll start with, I guess, a complicated one that I think will be interesting to hear, like both of your perspectives and both of your backgrounds on. So, how is Russian public opinion being? How's Ru how's Russian public opinion on the war, and how is it evolving as the war progresses, and how is it affected by conditions on the front line? And perhaps more importantly, will this actually bring about any change in what the Kremlin is actually doing? Um, other of you could go ahead. Uh, I'm happy to answer that question. So when the war began, uh, and of course this war has had different phases, it really began in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea and the uh, conflict in the Donbass uh, started. But, but when I'm referring to the war, I really mean this last phase of the eight months when Russia formally invaded Ukraine. Uh, Russian uh, public opinion uh, significantly changed. There was a rally around the flag effect, and according to uh, most public opinion polls, and I mainly trust uh, the independent uh, pollsters in Russia, the leading uh, independent uh, polling group in Russia is called the Levada Center, and they, they do excellent work. Um, they showed that Putin's approval ratings uh, went uh, as high as 80% uh, and above. Uh, they have since gone down slightly, but uh, still the vast majority of Russians continue to support Putin and continue to support the so-called special military operation. Uh, now, that's just the top line poll, right? Uh, when we look under the surface, uh, we see some interesting dynamics. Uh, there are the hardcore supporters of the Russian regime. And then I would say that there's a, a broad part of the public who are um, ambivalent about what's going on. If you ask them, uh, would you support Russia's escalation of the war, they would say yes, but most of them will. Or if you ask them, would you support Russia coming to the negotiating table, they would also say yes. So, so this is the part of the public that's indifferent, and I would say that's about a third. And then there, there are those Russians who uh, oppose the war, um, but many of them have left. We've seen hundreds of thousands of Russians leave uh, since the beginning, and especially after the so-called partial mobilization was announced. Uh, and more and more Russians are, are leaving every day. Um, so how does this affect uh, Putin's positions? Uh, how does this affect uh, the Kremlin's approach to the war? Well, I think uh, Putin has to tread very carefully when he announced the partial mobilization and there was a lot of chaos about how the mobilization was implemented. Uh, many people were drafted who were not supposed to be conscripted. Uh, many people 
uh, were uh, leaving uh, Russia at the time, uh, he realized that that he could not uh, make this a uh, a general mobilization. So, uh, so just recently, Russia announced that the partial mobilization is concluded, at least for the time being. The, they haven't uh, signed any decree about this, but uh, but in any case, uh, officially, the uh, the partial mobilization has been stopped. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the Kremlin uh, is uh, constantly relying on its uh, state propaganda, mainly through television, but also telegram channels, uh, other social media, in order to uh, sell its narrative of the war. Mainly that this is a war not between Russia and Ukraine, but rather between Russia and the West. That. Uh, like for Ukraine, uh, this war being existential, this is an existential war for Russia, uh, and uh, that uh, the the West hates Russia. This narrative about cancel culture uh, has uh, been very persistent uh, in the beginning when uh, when Russian uh, athletes uh, started to be banned from international competition when. Uh, Russian cultural figures were canceled. Uh, Western universities were severing ties from uh, w Russian institutions uh, of higher education. This uh, all uh, played into Putin's hands in the sense that he could say, that he could point out every instance uh, of so-called Russophobia, right, and say that, that the West hates us and, and, and so we're, uh, we're fighting for our survival. Um, and I think the majority of the, the Russian public bought it. Even in some uh, experimental polling that's been done, and we can talk about polling methodology, uh, the majority of Russians say that they support uh, the so-called special military operation. I think I'll stop there. So I'll just maybe add, um, as distinct from the bottom up sort of perspective, um, kind of the top top down perspective, uh, the regime itself. You remember that over the course of twenty two years, you know, Putin has uh, built this into a pretty highly cent centralized, personalistic, authoritarian regime um, that is really sort of held together uh, on his personal authority, um, and. Uh, that has really significant implications for the actual sort of structure of the state, um, the machinery that, that the state has uh, to um, maintain social political order, um, but obviously how, how things operate. Uh, it's not a highly bureaucratized one-party system like the Soviet Union had, had been, um, where other entities, uh, you know, the Communist Party sort of existed with authority and capabilities independent from the general secretary and, and so on and so forth. Um, but everything radiates from, uh, from Putin and his personal authority and, and politics uh, at, at the regime level really is, um, is, is a, a bunch of sort of relationships, you know, sort of between Putin and key interlocutors. Uh, so what does this, um, you know, what does this sort of mean uh, in, in the big picture uh, that uh, Nick asked about? Um, it, there's a fairly narrow segment of elites uh, on, on whom Putin is dependent and who depend on him. Um, they have nothing without him. Uh, and, you know, whether we're talking the economic elites or most of the sort of traditional security elites, uh, again, if 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 he wanted to sort of take it away, you know what what the czar had had granted them, um, he could do so. Uh, and so, their future for now is closely tied to his fate. And so, there are good reasons why they are unlikely to abandon him. Um, you know, other than in extraordinarily dire circumstances, uh, he's also dependent uh, upon them. Again, it's these sort of. Uh, informal and more personalized connections that that are actually how Russia is is governed. Um, so they are mutually uh, mutually dependent, but um, you know, sort of that that narrowness means that they really are probably bound to each other to the very end. Now there are some implications, you know, from 
our perspective, uh, you know, our policies, I think, should be geared towards um, raising potential costs of those elite supporters um, and making clear to them that things that they decide to do now or, or they decide to, to not do could have significant implications for how they are viewed in a post-Putin world. Um, and so uh, I think some degree of communication that uh, uh, to them uh, through back channels I, I think would be useful. Um, but we also now start to see, so this is, this is all to say that, you know, if you want to sort of know about the future of Russia and, and their political system, and here I'm not saying anything particularly insightful, look very closely at the elites and look for signs of fracture uh, and, and division among the elites. And, you know, we are seeing some little signs of that, probably nothing yet that is, um, you know, earth shattering or existential. But, you know, when you see uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, the, the leader of Chechnya, um, you know, openly questioning and, and criticizing Putin, not for starting the war, but for not fighting it hard enough and brutally enough. Um, but, uh, but also uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, the, uh, the founder uh, who's finally admitted to being the founder of the Wagner Group uh, of mercenaries. Um, he also runs a brisk cooking uh, and catering business, I understand. Um, he has been uh, much more vocal um, uh, of questioning uh, not directly Putin, but certainly elements of, of you know, Russia's uh, security apparatus in ways that pretty clearly implicate um, Putin. And so those types of cracks, those, those sort of criticisms are things that we never saw prior to February, um, never heard them publicly. And so the fact that, that they are here, I think is significant, but again, we can't get too over, overly exuberant and say, ah, the, you know, the end is near. Again, one thing that 22 years of concentration of power has done is, is develop a highly effective repressive apparatus in Russia. Um, th there's much that he can do to stay in power, and he will. He will do a, nearly anything to stay in power, I think. It's quite interesting because we haven't really seen major defection of the elites. Uh, early on in the war, people were predicting that there could be some kind of palace coup, and ultimately I think uh, this uh, was uh, overblown because uh, uh, Putin, uh, Putin's inner circle are largely the Siloviki, the uh, so-called strongmen who lead the military and the security services, and they're uh, very closely uh, aligned with him. Uh, in terms of uh, people like Kadyrov and Prigozhin, they're also dependent on uh, the Kremlin. And, and so uh, they're, they're able to criticize the conduct of the war, but they will never criticize the war itself or, or Putin. Uh, in fact, when you look at uh, Russian uh, propaganda telegram channels, you will see that there's a fairly healthy debate about the conduct of the war. There are some people who say, uh, you know, that Russia should uh, be more um, cautious or moderate, and then there are those who, who say that Russia needs to escalate uh, the invasion. Uh, and yet you will never find uh, any, anybody critical of Putin uh, or the invasion itself. Um, also, I think it's important to, to point out that those uh, oligarchs uh, or influential people in Russia who are independent of the Kremlin. One example is uh, someone named Konstantin Malafeyev, who uh, was uh, uh, in, uh, a huge uh, supporter of uh, the initial war in Donbass back in 2014 and funded uh, many um, mercenary groups, and he, he has his, his own television channel called Sargrad, which is uh, meant to promote um, a kind of Tsarist, orthodox vision of Russia. Uh, he has been, uh, in many ways, sidelined in the last few months because he's seen as too much of an independent figure who's not tied to the government, because he has businesses that that make money, as opposed to people like Prigozhin, who, who's dependent entirely on uh, on uh, Kremlin money, uh, wherever it may come from, probably uh, from uh, from the security services. Um, and I should also point out that that for Putin, uh, absolute popularity is actually less important than 
the uh, perception that he is popular, because that is what keeps the elites in line. The moment that uh, there is uh, <laughs> there is a, a <laughs> the moment that um, there is a view uh, in Russia that that Putin is is not so popular. That's when you may see scenarios like the palace coup, someone um, more conservative than Putin, like Nikolai Patrushev, the the head of the, uh, the, the, the Russian Security Council coming to power. Thank you, yeah. I enjoyed hearing both of your perspectives on like both the public and the elite opinions. That was good. Um, I could ask more questions, but I think I'd like to move on to the general audience Q&A. Um, if I could borrow that microphone. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you guys want to do a Q&A, could you please kind of like line up on the stairs here so I can pass you the mic more easily? Um, Great, thank you. Be fast. Yeah. Hi, uh, Rocky White, uh, Director of Maritime Studies. I want to ask about the Black Sea Grain Initiative, and what and whether you think it will continue, and if it falls apart, if um, uh, NATO countries would escort Ukrainian grain vessels uh, through the Black Sea, kind of like we did with Kuwaiti oil tankers during the tanker war, and context of that, I think it's been very interesting to watch the Black Sea fleet, which is mostly bottled up since the successful drone attack by the Ukrainians. So I think the maritime security piece of this has really changed, and I'd like to hear both of your commentary on that. Thank you. Thanks. I'll just make a quick observation, because I uh, d don't, don't know enough about maritime security to comment on this fully, but after the drone attack, Russia's reaction was to pull out of the grain deal. Uh, and of course, uh, in response, uh, Ukraine, Turkey, and the UN said that they would, uh, would uh, continue the grain deal without Russia's participation. And then a few days later, Russia returned to the grain deal. Well, the logic of this is, I think, quite simple. Russia understands that it can no longer enforce the naval blockade in the Black Sea. And so, uh, inevitably, uh, you know, R Russia needs to decide, will it uh, will it be part of the deal or not? So, so I think it's in Russia's interest to continue yeah. being a part of the deal. And as long as the military balance of power in the Black Sea remains as it is, uh, then you know it's likely that the grain deal will persist. There are there are other uh, qu questions. Uh, you know, for example, there, there's a, a deal being discussed at the UN level about fertilizer that is that is not uh, entirely certain. But I think the grain deal, for for the time being at least, uh, is is in good hands. I'd maybe just add that, uh, you know, listen, from, from day one of this war, uh, or at least the, 20, the, the February uh, war, and even, even prior to, uh, to February, um, so much of Russia's uh, strategy has, has been um, founded on, on essentially a strategy, a strategy of blackmail, um, or if we wanted to be a little bit more sort of formal coercion um, about making or implying threats of retaliation in order to deter uh, really the, the critical adversary um, that they've got their eye on, which, which is the United States, NATO, and, and our allies. And so, you know, go back, some, sometimes when I sit down and think back to, to old sort of debates from early in the war, um, you know, we can't provide too much weaponry to, to the Ukrainians, otherwise Russia will retaliate. Um, we can't do, you know, we, we, we can't give them um, you know, longer range weapons, otherwise they'll retaliate. We can't do this, otherwise they're red. And, and, and different iterations of, you know, proper nouns, you know, we can fill in whether it's this weapon system or this activity or this, this action. And, and the reality is, again, new information being revealed all the time about each side's capabilities. Uh, time and time again, Russia has shown itself to be incapable and, in w un and unwilling to follow through on the terrible things that, frankly, many of us imagined they were planning. So a lot of this, you know, coercion and, and deterrence is all about getting inside the mind of your adversary. Um, but fundamentally, they have not changed the, the equation. And so to, to the question about, uh, I, I, I think it's incredibly telling that three days after they announced that they were pulling out, they were back in. Yeah. That reveals 
a lot about um, sort of their, their bluffing or the credibility of their threats. And so not to be reckless, but I would also extrapolate from that uh, that more assertive measures to peacefully escort Ukrainian ships through the Black Sea um, would be calling a, a, a bluff that Russia is not, not willing to, to actually back up. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I'll pass it on to our next uh, person. Hi, my name is Emily. Um, and my question just goes out to the both of you, uh, especially if we're considering all non-military measures by which um, the US can participate or other countries can participate to pressure Russia out of the war. Um, you've brought up like the bargaining strategy and like getting inside the mind of the opponent. But this is mostly external. And what do you, the both of you think about this designation of Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism? Obviously, I've heard a lot of Ukrainian policy experts talk about um, advocate for advocating for it and the changes that can come about through like the criminal uh, justice system or um, the like immediate economic impacts of it. Whereas a lot of US policy experts are more on the conservative side. They're not as sure about it. Yeah, I, m maybe it's Maybe I find myself as as a little bit of a product or or shaped by uh, by by that sort of American um, sort of military uh, perspective. You know, the reality is that uh, conceptually we don't have a there is no sort of international or even national standard definition of what uh, what constitutes terrorism, um, and so that's a little bit problematic. It it certainly then does have, depending on which statute you're talking about, has implications in under national and international law. But, you know, I guess my reaction is that the practical consequence, wh whether we call them it or, or, or not, doesn't really change um, much materially uh, right now in, in the course of the fight. Um, it could down down the road when when Mr. Putin is standing, you know, before an international war tribunal, which unfortunately he will never do. Um, so I think it's all a little bit hypothetical. Um, but in the meantime, I think there are much, there are significant, much more practical and much more effective measures that we and our allies could be taking to actually pressure Russia. Uh, to um, to to end its invasion and and there's far more that we could be doing on on the economic front uh, on the sanctions front uh, things that um, that that uh, we still have a, a lot of capacity to expand that pressure and I think that would fundamentally um, carry a lot more weight and and impact Russian behavior much more than than what's essentially a symbolic designation as as a state sponsor of terror. I mean, I would just caution about um, relying too much on sanctions in terms of changing Russia's behavior. Uh, we haven't uh, really seen the sanctions be effective in that sense, uh, right? I mean, uh, if if the goal of sanctions is to change uh, Russian behavior or to somehow influence uh, Russian public opinion and bring about a revolution, then the sanctions have failed. What the sanctions have been good at is uh, limiting Russia's uh, ability to sustain its uh, military operation. And, and in, in that sense, we've seen um, you know, Russia um, losing its ability to import uh, certain technologies, particularly uh, advanced uh, semiconductors uh, that, you know, that, that can be used for um, military hardware. Uh, we've seen uh, Russia uh, using microchips that that are intended for dishwashers and you know, putting them into uh, guided missile systems. Uh, so, uh, so I think sanctions can be used used for this purpose. Also, I think uh, if the price cap on Russian oil uh, ends up being effective, and that's a big if because uh, it's not it's not certain that it will be. Russia uh, has ways of exporting uh, oil through, uh, you know, third parties, uh, you know, and selling it on the black market. Uh, it's already selling oil at a $30, $40 discount uh, to countries like China and India. And, and I think it will continue to do so. But if there's a way to limit 
the, the revenue that Russia gets from uh, its energy exports, uh, then that would uh, significantly impact Russia's ability to wage the war. Great. Thank you so much. We'll move on to our next uh, um, thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Connor. Um, and so in the past few years, we've seen a lot of talk about misinformation. Some people have said we're in an age of post-truth now. And I want to ask that, I remember very vividly when the war just broke out, there was a lot of talk, there was a lot of stories about things like the ghost in the ghost of Kiev um, and other kind of, there's a lot of information warfare, a lot of propaganda, a lot of stories that were put out that were eventually proven um, to be not so true. Um, and I was wondering, what do you think um, if this kind of information warfare and propaganda is just a part of modern warfare, if we're just going to keep seeing it over and over again, and how that ethically might conflict with our love for truth and our uh, understanding of how important truth is when it seems like all, it's really important for certain military conflicts that there are these kind of um, hopeful stories of things like the ghost of Kiev. Thank you. I mean, I think misinformation war, uh, informational warfare, misinformation, psychological warfare um, has, has been a part of warfare since, uh, since the first dude picked up a rock and smashed someone over, over the head. You know, hey, look over there. Right. You know, there's your misinformation misdirection. Um, so so it, it has always been uh, a part of war. Um, I think, uh, and, and, and so in that respect, it's, it's not surprising, um, you know, that, that we see it on, on both sides, um, you know, especially in, in the age of mass warfare, where, uh, you know, this is about sort of motiv motivating and mobilizing sort of total population, if not to fight, then, then to at least support uh, support the war, uh, the war effort. I think what's interesting in the Russian case is that they have long been very effective at using these sorts of measures um, in in the context of of non kinetic uh, conflict, um, things short of of uh, direct combat, um, and ironically. Uh, and this is a, a theme that I explore in, in my work on, on Russian grand strategy. You know, ironically, I think they were at their most effective, you know, from about 2007 to 2016, um, when they pursued uh, a, a very aggressive, call it a hybrid information war, political warfare. All those terms are, are debated and disputed by, you know, in, in academia. But, um, but the, the general strategy is, you know, how can I weaken and divide and disrupt uh, my adversary, um, sort of counterbalance them um, in order to en enhance my relative standing. Um, and, and, it's, and, and the irony is that when they have now swung back towards traditional kinetic military action, conventional mater material action to, to achieve their fundamental interests, um, it, it has backfired on them. In, in spectacular ways. Um, and so I, I would just sort of close by inserting a little bit of, of caution that uh, our attention tends to, to shift very quickly. And obviously now we're in a moment where we're focused very intently on Russian conven conventional military capabilities and activities and threats. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the, uh, the information warfare threat has gone away. Um, and, uh, you know, it is still among us. We see it in our own politics. We see it in our own news cycles. We see it in our own electoral cycles. Um, and so that's something that, that, you know, we certainly need to be uh, on, on the defense about because, like it or not, Russia perceives itself to be in a constant state of warfare against the United States, even if it's never directly kinetic um, or even though it, it goes through different phases of, of kinetic uh, conflict or, or sort of more political conflict. I don't have too much to add, only to say that uh, it's uh, been uh, surprising to see how effective Ukraine's information strategy has been in this war. All of the uh, social media memes and, uh, you know, Zelensky uh, tweeting constantly and, 
uh, you know, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. You can just look at their Twitter channel and see the the, the videos, all of the references to American culture and Russian culture. Uh, so, in many ways, giving Russia a taste of its own medicine when it comes to uh, information warfare, you know, misinformation, and so on. Uh, and we are, in many ways, in the fog of war. So I uh, take. Uh, everything I read in Russian media with a grain of salt, but I take many things I read in the Ukrainian media also with a grain of salt. Uh, and try to look at uh, various sources. I, I think uh, generally you can trust uh, Western reporting. Uh, the uh, you know the major U.S. newspapers have done a pretty good job of reporting on the war. You know, New York Times, Washington Post, and others. But it's also uh, very important to to hear from local correspondents. And so. Uh, for example, um, uh, well, uh, m many of the major U.S. Uh, newspapers, publications have correspondents locally in both Ukraine and Russia, and, and those are the folks I trust the most to, to re report it like it really is. I'll, I'll also add on that note. Um, you know, it's interesting. We, we may or may not be, be watching the um, implosion before our eyes of Twitter, uh, depending on who you ask at, at any given moment. But I think, one, and, and listen, that platform and certainly its new own, owner um, have uh, a lot of um, faults. Uh, but one thing that it has, it has provided extraordinarily well, I think, throughout this conflict is you know, direct access to uh, Ukrainian voices on the ground, um, whether they're citizens, uh, advocates, um, uh, journalists, uh, and, and so it, it has been, and, and yes, you got to sort through, there, there's a, always the potential for, uh, for lower quality information that, that you kind of have to sort through. But, um, but we've had sort of a direct information source from those uh, sort of native authentic voices um, in in a way that has been sort of very useful for those of us that are uh, that are this far away and so uh, you know regardless of, of what you feel about Elon and and how much you know you're gonna pay for your little blue check mark uh, it's um, I, I think it, it would be unfortunate if you know if the platform sort of descends into chaos or worse uh, because um, it, it, it'll be harder for those voices, I think, to get out, and 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 they have, you know, up to now been been very effective, and 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 as you noted, very savvy in in how they uh, in how they communicate uh, to the rest of the world, and and has made a significant difference, I think, in 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 how the world views the conflict. Great, yeah, thank you. I definitely agree with you. <laughs> the Ukrainians have been pretty clever about their use of media. Definitely appreciate that. Um, we'll go into our next person. Good afternoon. I'm Mitch Minsale. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today. Uh, my question uh, revolves around different sectors within the Russian uh, blogger community, the military bloggers, and the differences between the Russian MOD and uh, the Wagner group and the, the growing divide between them. Um, recently, Wagner has been very explicit with arguing that they are doing a much better job than the Russian MOD, especially around the area territory of Bakhmut, and they've called for the removal of multiple Russian military defense uh, personnel, which Putin has been reluctant but uh, engaged with a couple different times. Is that the growing divide that we should be looking at between the different pro-war factions, but within the Wagner versus Russian MOD, or is that something we should be paying attention to? I think it's certainly an interesting dynamic. Uh, the Wagner Group has uh, has always been a bit of a nuisance for the Russian military. Even if you go back to the war in in Syria, uh, you know, the R Russian Ministry of Defense uh, officials never particularly liked the Wagner Group, and so we're seeing that uh, today. Uh, you know, when, th when there was news about. Uh, certain uh, certain cities being taken in Ukraine. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it was written as a Wagner Group with the support of the Russian military, which of course was very embarrassing to uh, the Russian uh, Ministry of Defense. Uh, for uh, for Putin, this is uh, useful for domestic political purposes. He doesn't want. Uh, you know, too powerful of a of a Russian military, and so that's why uh, you see these other uh, 
um, groups. I mean, Wagner Group is not the only uh, mercenary group, but but it's it's the most powerful, arguably. And they just opened a major uh, center in Saint Petersburg. Uh, this this huge building that they're uh, they're going to use for uh, recruitment and and other purposes. Um, but you also see, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this um, uh, group called Rosgvardia. It's the the, the Russian uh, National Guard. Uh, no, nothing close to what what the National Guard is in the United States. It's uh, more of a uh, well. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's more for, for policing purposes, and they've been using Rosguardia fairly uh, effectively uh, on the, uh, the occupied territories in uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporozhye, and Kherson to stifle uh, discontent. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then, of course, uh, the security services are also playing a major role. The, the FSB, uh, the, the, the GRU now actually has, has taken over uh, control for for Russia's uh, intelligence in Ukraine, uh, so so that has been an interesting dynamic to watch. But uh, but again, I, I wouldn't read too much into it because, of course, the the Russian military is still uh, is still leading the the assault on Ukraine, uh, and uh, I think I think that will continue. Yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah, I feel like I don't really read much about that kind of dynamic between the Russia's military and other military services within Russia. Um, we'll move it on to you. Uh, first, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Midshipman Garriman uh, from the Naval Academy, and uh, my question revolves around uh, the impacts on global energy uh, policy. So recently, the fighting in Ukraine has shed light on the European reliance on Russian energy exports. Uh, Germany has begun gas rationing in preparation for what could potentially be a very cold winter. And in tandem, OPEC has uh, recently announced a two, mi two million barrel a day cut to its oil production. So what does the path look like for uh, U.S. and Western Europe to reduce reliance on these uh, potentially volatile sources of uh, energy? So I think that, well, I guess the path is clear in different ways, uh, whether we're talking about the U.S. or, or Europe. Um, I mean, Europe's path uh, ahead is clear in the sense that, you know, we know that it's, it's going to be a, a difficult and, and costly winter. Um, you know, not, may, not so much sort of in, in the, um, you know, existential uh, sense of, uh, you know, folks freezing to death. Um, but uh, but in the sense that you know energy and everything that that depends on energy you know will will probably be uh, significantly affected in terms of prices in in a period that's already characterized by by rising inflation, um, and so you know of course one has to be concerned about the the effects uh, on public opinion uh, and continued support. But, but I think Europe has remained sort of remarkably resolute up till now. And, and if they can sort of maintain that, that focus and, and, um, and commitment to, uh, you know, to, to bearing the pain of, uh, of isolating Russia, uh, along its most, most valuable resource, uh, if they can make it through, through the winter, then, then I think we'll be in a fundamentally different era where sort of a dependence on Russian energy, at least in the West, you know, will have been uh, will have been broken. It's an easier story for the United States um, because uh, you know we we imported a very small quantity of uh, Russian oil even prior to the war, and and we've already cut that off. Um, and you know we are awash in our own um, natural gas. So uh, so energy shortages, you know, obviously. Um, are not uh, not something that we have to to worry about in in the coming winter, but uh, we do have to worry about you know rising and 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 higher energy prices in general, and and how that continues to fuel inflation in our own system and and the political follow on effects. Uh, but again, interesting that. Um, you know, you, you may have noticed we actually just had an election uh, in this country when everybody was expecting inflation to be 
sort of the number one issue that that was going to drive um, you know a massive rejection of of the incumbent Democratic Party. I mean that didn't happen, uh, and so. Uh, at this stage, you know, yes, inflation remains a, a concern for our own, own de domestic um, e economic health. But uh, I think, you know, since we are now past the election and facing uh, a Congress with very thin majorities um, who will be unlikely to significantly change the trajectory of American aid and support for Ukraine. Um, I, I think uh, I, I think we're going to get through this one and uh, relatively unscathed as well. But I should also note, political scientists are bad at predicting the future, so a lot of a lot of grains of salt. The only thing I might add that's uh, quite interesting is uh, as uh, Europe uh, decreases its reliance on Russian gas, and of course uh, these next few months will be. Difficult because you know even though gas prices are are uh, currently decreasing, it's because uh, there there aren't any places to store it. And if the winter is going to be particularly cold, then uh, you know some countries uh, will will have a particularly difficult time with uh, with heating and uh, sustaining certain industries. Um, but but in Russia, uh, actually. Uh, Gazprom, the state uh, gas uh, monopolist, is going through a very difficult time right now because uh, they're they're hardly getting any uh, revenue from uh, gas uh, exports, and so uh, there there's a major um, uh, issue for the Kremlin to decide: either they're going to have to subsidize the company, uh, or they're going to have to increase prices for gas internally because 75 percent of Gazprom's gas is for internal consumption as opposed to uh, uh, export. And, and this is a major problem because Russia still needs this company in order to, uh, to have uh, heating for, uh, for its own people. And, uh, and so this will be uh, an interesting uh, issue to watch. Uh, will, uh, will Gazprom stay afloat in the coming months uh, given the uh, uh, the the turbulence uh, in Europe and and uh, Putin's decision to to cut off Europe from Russian natural gas. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we have enough time for one more person. So, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Manuel, and my question is about the uh, um, maybe theoretical aspect of the the war in Ukraine regarding political science, right? So in my political science class, for example, we have read a lot of theories and a lot of authors that give different views on the war in Ukraine. And, and none of them sometimes seem to, to get it quite well. So what is your opinion on maybe which theories that have been developed in international relations or political science can explain the events of the war in Ukraine or the current panorama that we have? So I think the elephant in the room is John Mearsheimer, uh, the neorealist or his neorealist position that this war was caused by NATO expansion um, over you know the the three decades of of the post Soviet um, period. And you know if if you're careful not to to delve too deep into the facts, it's a uh, you may tell that I have an opinion on this one. Um, it, it's a, uh, it is a compelling and, uh, and certainly parsimonious explanation that, you know, the expansion of NATO into the post-communist and then post-Soviet states of, of the Baltics um, or former so Soviet states of, of the Baltics. Um, you know, provoked an insecurity in in Russia that that then compelled it to to lash out in in support of its sort of reasonable uh, self defense interests. Uh, like I said, when you actually get into some of the evidence, uh, the the theoretical explanation I think breaks down um, in in some really significant ways. Uh, number one, there's no accounting for the timing. 
um, you know, again, these these episodes of uh, of, of Russian tantrums, um, if, if you will, lashing out, uh, don't correspond, um, you know, with, with actual sort of instances of, of expansion or, or expression to, to do so. Um, and so if we, if we believe that temporality is an important part of the causal sort of story, um, then that's something that, uh, that Mearsheimer's argument really can't, uh, can't do very well. Um, it, it also is helpful to actually sort of look, uh, and, and here's where I, I believe again, sort of contrary maybe to, to the, to the neorealists, that actually knowing something about the internal dynamics and politics of, uh, of, of great powers or any powers actually is important for understanding why they do what they do. Um, and if you look at uh, a very long history of reactions, actions, and even public statements from Putin himself, um, you'll see that in the early 2000s, uh, he is on the record of, of saying in numerous uh, occasions, listen, the Balts, um, you know, if they want to join NATO, that's their business. That's not, our, that's not for us to decide. He says the exact same thing about Ukraine. Um, this is for uh, Ukraine and NATO alliance to decide for themselves. Um, and so clearly something changed, but it's not as if there was this sort of eternal, immutable, anarchic-driven, existential sort of opposition to, uh, to NATO expansion. Um, and so I actually m made this argument uh, in, in an article for the Journal of Democracy that I, that I wrote with Mike McFall, former ambassador, uh, to Russia where we say the real critical turning point are actually the colored revolutions. It's, it's the orange revolution, sort of these moments when mass mobilization uh, begin to reveal that, you know, the populations of the post-Soviet states and of Ukraine in particular, they do not see their future as one linked with Russia. Um, and ever since then, time and time again, um, when given the opportunity, the Ukrainians have shown themselves that, you know, the, the desire to turn towards Europe. And so coming back to sort of that fundamental interest that we spoke about at the very, very beginning of, you know, Putin seeing Ukraine as, as really just sort of a vassal state of, uh, of Russia, whose policies he can control, um, it, it really is more about reacting to the internal choices of Ukraine to, to cast itself with the West more so than, than any sort of incoming threat from, from NATO. Um, so again, I, I don't believe that he uh, objectively sort of sees uh, NATO expansion as an, as an existential threat. And, and for proof of that, you know, when was the last time you heard him uh, start a war against Finland and Sweden because they just decided they, that they were going to join NATO? Um, again, we've heard barely a peep out of Moscow um, over, over that. So, um, so I know I didn't really offer a, a theoretical alternative to take that place, but um, but I do think that uh, that this is one case, you know, though I respect his, his academic work very much, uh, I think practically speaking, um, you know, John Mearsheimer and, and sort of those who hew to that argument uh, have just gotten this one flat out wrong. This is all off the record, right? <laughs> So I'm not going to offer a theoretical explanation either, but what I will say is that uh, uh, single causal explanations of this war are generally wrong, right? It's a number of different factors uh, and trends that led to where we are today. Uh, the first one being uh, Russia's, uh, in some sense, uh, return to uh, imperialism and not recognizing Ukrainian statehood. Um, the second, I think, uh, very well could be this security dilemma between Russia and NATO. Not so much expansion, but rather increased R Russian and NATO military activities in Central and Eastern Europe, especially after 2014. We saw greater uh, NATO military drills in Central and Eastern Europe. We did see uh, NATO uh, trainers in Ukraine. And so it wasn't so much about NATO membership, 
that Russia was concerned about. It was about actual NATO military infrastructure getting closer to Russia's borders, right? So that's the second explanation. Uh, the third explanation, I've given many lectures on this, is Ukrainian domestic politics, what was actually happening inside. Um, initially, Zelensky uh, came uh, to the presidency as essentially a pro-peace candidate. There were many Ukrainians who said he's actually a Russian stooge or he's a stooge of one of the oligarchs, uh, Kolomoisky. Uh, and he came to the negotiating table in the Normandy uh, format and initially agreed to something called the Steinmeier formula, uh, which, which was uh, to, to conduct uh, elections uh, in uh, the Donbass uh, territories of Donetsk and Luhansk and, and uh, under um, the observation of international observers and then only later to uh, regain control of the border. But then he reneged on this agreement uh, and ultimately the, the Minsk peace process was stalled for a couple of years. Um, and uh, we saw Zelensky going after certain pro-Russian oligarchs like Viktor Medvedchuk. This was, was a pivotal uh, moment for Putin because, uh, uh, because Putin has very close relations with Medvedchuk. In fact, Medvedchuk's daughter is Putin's uh, goddaughter. Uh, and uh, and so, so this, this was something that he took as a personal affront. Uh, another explanation is Russian domestic politics, what was going on inside, and this is where the color revolutions issue does come in. Uh, for, um, for, for many years, Putin was able to uh, effectively control uh, domestic dissent uh, by, uh, by letting the protests uh, dissipate on their own. Uh, these were protests that were led by people like anti-corruption activist Alexei Navalny. And then only uh, last year, uh, he, he realized that, uh, that he could no longer uh, let the protests uh, kind of dissolve on their own, that he needed to, uh, uh, to, to stifle internal dissent much more brutally. And, uh, and that uh, a small, a victorious war would allow him to uh, to regain popular support in the same way that he he did back in 2014 when he annexed Crimea, right? And then two two other explanations. One is the failure of diplomacy between Russia and the West. Fundamentally, uh, Russia and uh, NATO and the United States could not come to an agreement uh, in. Uh, December of last year and January of this year when Russia proposed two draft treaties uh, asking for various security guarantees. And I was in Moscow at the time and I was talking to my Russian counterparts and I, and I asked them, well, how do you expect to uh, negotiate in a few months something that has taken almost 30 years to build, which is the European security architecture? And to that, they had no response. They said essentially that Russian troops would stay on Ukraine's borders for as long as it takes to reach some kind of settlement. Uh, well, and ultimately, <laughs> there just wasn't the time. You remember uh, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, coming to, uh, to Moscow on the eve of the war, sitting at that long table, trying to reach some kind of agreement. Well, it just it didn't happen because uh, there, there, there wasn't enough time simply to do that. And then the last explanation, and probably the most important, uh, is uh, Putin's miscalculations. In the last uh, couple of years, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, Putin has isolated himself. Uh, and uh, he gets information from a very small number of uh, sources. Uh, and uh, he thought that uh, Russian troops would be able to take Kiev in, in three to five days. Uh, and of course, uh, didn't, didn't realize uh, that Russia would have the uh, logistical problems, the problems in terms of morale that it faced, and, and uh, the, um, the resilience of the Ukrainian troops. Uh, and, and also, I think, uh, Ukrainian uh, public opinion. Uh, you know, Russian diplomats uh, in Ukraine are uh, notorious for not knowing Ukrainian uh, because uh, the Russian foreign ministry never saw a need uh, to, to teach his diplomats Ukrainian. 
uh, they, they kind of assume that they knew everything there is to know about Ukraine. Uh, the Russian security services spent uh, millions of dollars trying to build intelligence networks within Ukraine, and all of this crumbled very quickly at the start of the war. So, so it was really a miscalculation on Putin's part. But as I said, uh, I gave you six different explanations. I think all of them have a semblance of truth uh, in them. You can't just take one of them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I think that was a good question to end off with. Um, so before we do our kind of breakout rooms again, I'm going to pass the mic off to Mariana, our director, for some closing remarks. Yeah. Thank you all so much for a very insightful panel. Um, so before we announce the breakout sessions, uh, I would just like to personally thank our panelists and everyone coming to this year's Civil Military Military Relations Conference. Uh, we really hope you found these presentations and friendships you've made insightful um, and throughout the weekend. And we would also like to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to speak at our conference and as well as everyone at Tisch College at the Institute of Global Leadership for making this weekend possible. Shout out Heather and Michaela <laughs> for <laughs> helping so much. and. Um, this has been in the works since this summer, so it, it's truly rewarding to see this come full circle now that we've finished our conference and all our hard work paying off because I think this went well. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, we hope to see you at next year's CMRC in 2023. Um, thank you so much. I know this is Veterans Day weekend and a lot of people are away this weekend, but I really appreciate you guys all taking the time um, to come to Tufts or just out of your day to listen to these panels. It, we really do appreciate it. Um, so now I will announce the breakout sessions. All right, so Mika, oh, right. Oh, yes. Okay, actually, first off, <laughs> we have um, a couple gifts for our speakers. Thank you. And we'll take a photo. Yeah, do you want to just? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The wall, yeah. And then yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, yeah. Yeah. we'll do one with just Nick, and then. Now I don't have one. Like yeah. yeah. just you. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, just just you and then you're gonna oh, moderate. Yeah. 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 Not just you. Yeah. yeah. What do you do? <laughs> and then we'll do <laughs> your three of us. But you give them weird things. Yeah. 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 We also give them little. I want to get some Harvard merch too. Wait, you get like actual swords? Yeah, like sabers and then also the little naval officers. Yeah. you give him a smaller sword? Thank all right, so for our breakout session, um, Mika will lead the group to with Mr. Burakovsky in room 231. And Nick is going to lead Dr. Person and the group to 235. So have questions. <laughs> um, you'll get to talk to uh, the panelists one on one. So. Yeah, but then the sword. Yeah, the side of this one. The thing is, 